Thank you very much, Shola, for that video. Um, once again, I'd like to welcome us all to uh, our, our P2SE um, seminar, which is the P2SE actually stands for Pay to Serve Employment Seminar. And the theme for today is Minding Your Own Business. Now, I'm actually excited. We have three very renowned um, public speakers, and um, I'll be introducing them one after the other. The first speaker um, would be introduced uh, uh, just about now, um, a lady, and then um, we will now go to a, a very successful business um, startup founder and also mentors to a lot of uh, business, upcoming businesses. Um, you get to find out his identity later on. And then to the person who is the chair of this entire process, the founder of uh, Beep Edge would be speak as the third speaker. Um, without much ado, I would like to um, acknowledge the presence of uh, Tobore Olumoye. Um, she's a personal finance coach and uh, she has written a book called Make Better Financial Decisions. I'm sure she would give us um, access to how we can order these books for those who don't have it already. Um, so good morning, madam. We are glad to have you. Um, Tobo Reo Lumoye, personal finance coach, author, make better financial decisions. You are welcome, ma. Thanks, Uban. Good to be here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, madam. Can I go right ahead? Yes, you can. Oh, fantastic. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this particular segment of today's session. I'll be talking about preparing for life after nine to five. So it's life after your paid employment. Now, many people leave paid employment for different reasons. There are several reasons. And some of the reasons are number one, compulsory retirement. So the law says you get to a particular age and you must retire. Even if you feel, oh, I can still work, I still have energy, but policies are policies and they'll be adhered to. So, so you will need to retire. For a lot of organizations in Nigeria, it's 60 years. For some, it's 70, especially those in academia, it's 70 years. But the truth of the matter is, even if it is 80 years, one day you must retire. So that's compulsory retirement when it's beyond you and you will have to leave paid employment. The second one is voluntary retirement. When you say to yourself, so sometimes companies come up and say, you know what, we want to rejig our workforce. Uh, the HR says we have a lot of old people in the system. We want to introduce young blood, but they won't come out and say, we want to introduce young blood. I want to get rid of old firewood. They will say, oh, we want to, if you have, we have an opportunity for people who would rather take early retirement to take it and will make it worth their while. Typically, they will give one year gross pay as an incentive to retirement with your full retirement benefits. And sometimes people opt out for early retirement. When they are prepared, when they are tired, some of them are just fed up and say, you know what? I'm tired of this job and I need to go do something else while I still have a little energy in my bones. That's voluntary retirement. The company is not kicking you out. The company is not insisting, but you are voluntarily saying, look, you know what? I want to leave, but it's retirement, but it's voluntary. Another common reason for retirement or for leaving paid employment is termination of appointment, where your employer says, I no longer require your services for different reasons. It can be because you committed an offense. It can be because they are trying to streamline their workforce. It can be any reason, or they are trying to shut down a particular department. 
your appointment just might be terminated or when you don't meet up with the goals that the organization has set for you, that's termination of appointment. Sometimes it can be redundancy and that's number four. Redundancy is when the organization says, you know what, you are working well, we like your services, we would love to keep you. Unfortunately, we can no longer afford to carry your wage bill and we, it pains us to have to let you go. All of this English is just meaning that we will no longer be paying your salary. Carry your bag and be going. The next one is voluntary resignation. Voluntary resignation means the company is not asking you to go. It's not your time for you to be retired. It's not, it's not voluntary retirement. You are not anywhere near retirement age, but you are saying, you know what? I think I can do more. I think I can be more. I think I'd rather take my chances elsewhere. I think I'd rather work for myself. I think I'd rather work for another organization. Or I think I'd rather just go home and you write to your organization and say, you know what? I am leaving you. You didn't do anything wrong, but I think it's time to move on. That's voluntary resignation. Of course, other, another reason for leaving will be ill health when you simply are unable to perform your functions. So you'll have to quit your job or the organization will have to ask you to go out of ill health. It's nobody's fault. Life sometimes happens like that. And the last reason is death. Death will happen to everyone. Sometimes death happens when you're in paid employment. And when death happens, death has happened. Now, for every single one of these, even including death, you ought to be prepared. You ought to be prepared for the day you will leave paid employment because you will leave. It is guaranteed. In fact, sometimes the company itself will die, then you will leave. For every single one of them, you ought to be prepared for voluntary retirement, for compulsory retirement, even for death you should be prepared. That is the ideal situation where you sit down and say, look, a day is coming when I will no longer work for this organization. When that day comes, what do I need? What do I need to put in place? What and what will be my requirements? How much am I earning now? How much ought I to put aside to be sure that when I quit this job, I will not be in penury, I will not be in crisis. That is the ideal situation, but here's the truth. Many people are not prepared. Many people have a lot of hope. Many people believe that life will sort itself out and therein lies the danger. For some people, if it is voluntary retirement, their chances are better. For some people, if it is compulsory retirement, their chances are better because they tend to be better prepared. Now, it doesn't matter which state you are in, which of the choices you end up making or which choices are made for you. There are a few things you must put in place. And those are some of the things we are going to discuss today. I do not have all day to talk about this. So what I'll do is I'll just share a few of the things I have learned on this journey. I chose voluntary resignation. I, I was in banking for a long time and I got a call while I was in banking, that I needed to do something more. The same way pastors get calls, the same way priests get called, the same way people get called to join the, the military, I received the call that I should take a message to the people. And, and until I quit my job, I simply couldn't function spirit, body, and soul. I could no longer function because my entire system kept saying, get out, get out, it is time to leave. Even though my pocket was not in consonance with getting out, even though I hadn't put all the things I felt I should have put in place, I simply couldn't stay because the urge was so strong and the message was so powerful and the message was so important. I had to resign. So I quit my job voluntarily and then I set out on, I set out on entrepreneurship. Gracious, if you can't hear me, it's because you are not connected. Your audio is not connected. So if you don't mind, Please connect. I don't know, Ubang, if you can type that in the chat box so she can see. So I had to leave. And then I had a plan. I, I didn't leave immediately. I said about the year before leaving. So in my mind, I was prepared. I had a plan. I had, it, it, I had plans. I had well-documented plans. Then I stepped into the marketplace and it was a different ball game. I, I'm going to share a few of the things I've learned along the way, just a few of them. We won't be able to cover all of them, but I'll touch on those that are extremely important. 
here's the thing. The first thing you need to realize and the first thing you need to do when you quit your job or when you leave paid employment or when you are asked to leave, whatever the case, when, when you leave paid employment, the very first thing you must do is rest. You need to rest. You need some time to undo paid employment from your mind. You need to detox. You need to get into that zone where you don't panic. If you were asked to leave your job, meaning that you were not prepared, don't panic. Take time out to rest. I always recommend at least six weeks. It takes time for you to debrief your mind from the rigors of paid employment. Paid employment does something to you. It puts you in a particular space. Just as entrepreneurship puts you in a particular space, whatever you are doing, you, you start to function in that role. For you to function effectively in another role, you need to debrief your mind. You need to debrief your mindset. You need to detox your mind if it is built and loaded with toxins. So you must rest. It, during your rest phase, that is not the time to start writing and planning. And no, that's the time to just say to your body, rest. If you don't rest then, you'll pay for it down the line. There's no point to panic. You have your whole years ahead of you. So that's the first thing you need to do. You need to rest. Your body needs to get out of that zone and be prepared for the journey ahead because the journey ahead is tough. The journey ahead is rigorous. The next thing you need to do is you need to be grateful. You need to be appreciative. Not everyone has the opportunity to work in paid employment. And paid employment is one of the best things that can happen to you, even as an entrepreneur or as a retiree. Paid employment affords you a lot of opportunities. You have the ability to meet people of value. You have the ability to learn corporate structure. You have the ability to work under authority. You have the ability to supervise. You've learned all of the skills required to interact with strange people, connect with customers, build relationships. Your mind is full of assets, all because of paid employment. Even if you were asked to go unjustly or unfairly, the best thing you can do for yourself is to be appreciative of the time you had in paid employment. This is very important. And many people miss out on it. They come out with a lot of bad energy. They come out with a lot of anger. Some of them begin to badmouth their organizations. It is the worst thing you can do because people are listening and people have the belief that if you badmouth the man who fed you, albeit very little or big, whatever it is, that that is the kind of attitude you will have towards their business if they were to let you in or towards their funds or towards their assets if they were to give you access. So learn to be appreciative of the time you had in paid employment because all of those things you learned will eventually become assets and things of value. The next thing you need to do now, after you have debriefed your mind, when your break time is over, when your leave is over, is you need to now strategize. You need to plan. It is extremely important that your plan is written down. It is very important. You don't plan mentally. You don't say, oh, from next year, by this time next year, I will have my office. I will employ two people. I will buy an official car. By now, we'll open our branch next year. You're just building castles in the air. You must sit down and write out your plans. You must have a clear-cut strategy. You must have a solid plan. And your plan must be written down and broken down into steps. When next we meet, whenever we have the opportunity again, I'll give you the different steps you need for your plan. But whatever it is, your plan must be broken down into months, into weeks, into years. Have a long-term vision and have plans for the short, the medium, and the long term. If you say, look, I'm going to, we're going to open, we're going to open our branch in, in Ghana, for instance. What are the requirements to open a business in Ghana? What do you need? What are the step-by-step -step requirements? How much do you require? If you don't write it down, you are most likely going to make mistakes. The next thing you need to look at is for every plan you have, what is the backup plan? I have this plan in place. What if this doesn't happen? What else? So you're going to have a tree that is very varied. It's going to have lots of branches. Okay, I'm going to go into catering. If catering doesn't work out, if, for instance, there's a government policy or there's a pandemic or there's a crisis, 
what else will I do? Oh, okay, I will not do catering of food. I'll do catering of snacks. I will not cater to large crowds. I'll cater to small crowds. It is a lot of work. You see why you needed to rest, have an issue. So you have all of those plans. You have backup for backup. The pandemic has taught us that you cannot plan Definitely, you cannot plan enough. You cannot cover all exigencies. But when you have multiple backups, it gives you provision and gives you room to pivot when a crisis does occur. So you, you need to have, I, I like to recommend at least two backup plans for every solid plan that you have. The next thing you need to do is to know your numbers. I'm a financial planner and numbers are everything. Numbers don't lie. Numbers don't speak English. Numbers are numbers. Numbers show the true picture. If, for instance, you were earning 500,000 Naira in paid employment, chances are you will continue to spend 500,000 Naira one year into post paid employment because that's a, lifetime you, that's a lifestyle you've already set in place. That's what you're already used to. So you are most likely going to continue to maintain that lifestyle until your life segues completely into post paid employment. So you need to have. Simple rule of thumb, you need to have your 6 million naira for one year. At least one year funds must be reserved. If you lost your job on, on, in an unplanned way and or ceremoniously, the question you're going to begin to ask yourself is, how do I cut back? What do I have in my hands? Because you're going to spread that money for one year. Even if you start a business, the business will not start paying you immediately, except you are in a pure service industry. Even then, you still need to build up your reserves, right? So you need to know your numbers. How much do I need? How much will it cost me to pay my child's school fees every month? How much is my rent every month? How much is cost of feeding? How... And then when you know your numbers, you need to stress those numbers. So for instance, if you say, okay, um, I need 100,000 Naira, for instance, to feed myself every month. So you can stress it both ways. You can say, in reality, what I will need to feed myself is 125,000 Naira. Or say, I will need to shrink this number and learn to live on 75,000 error. You must stress those numbers so that you have a buffer in case of emergencies. The next thing you need to realize is that entrepreneurship is not a joke. Entrepreneurship is not a child's play. And if you get into retirement, you are going to become an entrepreneur of some sort. How successful you are or how unsuccessful you are depends on how well you perform and how well you prepare for your entrepreneurship journey. So if you're going to become an entrepreneur, the first thing I'm going to say to you is that you should normalize paying for information. You don't know everything. In fact, what you knew in paid employment, I'll share my own self with you. I worked in banking for a very long time and I, my banking career spread across all aspects of banking. I met tons of clients. I was exposed to thousands upon thousands of business types. So in my mind, I understood business. In my mind, I, I understood customers. I understood paying patterns. I understood all of those. But when I got into the marketplace, it was a totally different ball game. So I needed to share what I thought I knew and I needed to pay for the reality on ground. And here's the thing, many people don't like to pay. They think, oh, I'll go and Google it. or oh, I'll watch free videos. Take it from someone who sells information. The information we give for free can never be compared to the information you pay for, never. So learn to pay for information. If you need value, learn to pay for value. And then you begin to get real value that is specific to your goal. Another thing you need to do is you need to learn to join groups. There are support groups, especially for females. There are all kinds of support groups. I belong to at least six support groups. In fact, it was because I joined, there's a particular group, I'll never forget them. It was as a result of my meeting a particular woman, she invited me, and thank God I did. All the people that helped me on my path to success as an entrepreneur, I met from that meeting. She gave me access to people that I would never have met. The strides I have gained in social media was, was because I gained those strides because I met people from that meeting. So you must learn to join groups because people, like-minded people come together and they share information. Join those groups and then get coaches and mentors. Some people work with one coach and one mentor, but I recommend, I have mentors for different things. I have coaches for different 
things. I cannot shout. I am still learning on this journey. And coaches and mentors make the journey a lot shorter. You don't spend. For me, time is a lot of money and I don't have time to waste trying and making errors and doing all the computation and permutation. No, I don't have that time. So I pick a coach, pay for a coach, and the coach shows me the shortcuts. Mentors show you where the stones are laid so that it looks like you're walking on water. You don't need to swim against the tide. Pick a mentor and work with a mentor and then do what the coach asks you to do. Your journey will be a lot smoother. Another thing I'm going to encourage you to do is to plan your day. When you leave paid employment, chances are you will think you are on vacation. You are not on vacation. Every day counts. And here's the reason. For every day you wake up, you are spending money. In fact, by just being alive, you are running, you are a cost center. For every day that passes that you don't make money, you have lost money. You need to plan your day every single day. Plan your activities for the day. Set out your top goals for the day. Say to yourself, and by the way, you should have a budget for revenue for the day anyway. So if you say, oh, every single day, I need to make an income of 50,000 naira. Where will the income come from? How am I going to make 50,000? Oh, for me to make 50,000, I must generate revenue of 150,000 naira per day. Plan it for those 20 days or 22 working days of the month. You must have a clear plan. And here's what begins to happen when you have a plan in place. Your mind opens and the forces of the universe come towards you. They're attracted to you. You begin to see opportunities. You begin to see how you can convert every single idea into a revenue generating or a value generating thing. Even if you are in retirement mode, chances are you don't even have enough to give out as inheritance. You don't have enough for your legacy plans. You don't have enough for your philanthropy and charity goals. So you need money. If you, if you are making money, I don't know what to do with it. There are people like Toboro Olumoye in the world who know how to spend money. So please make money per day. And there are people around who can help you expense those funds if you don't know how to. You need to be committed. And I think this is where the big difference is. Many people are not committed. They love the idea of goal setting. They love the idea of planning, but they are not committed to the goals. They face a roadblock and then jump off. Examples are bound. You see people today, they start with baking. Everybody is baking. So they feel, oh, there must be money in baking. They go rent a shop. They start baking. They bake five cakes. Nobody buys. They throw the cakes away. They market and market, post on status, post on Instagram, do Facebook ads. People are not buying. They say, ah, this cake business is not for me. I will go and do, what was the next one? I'll do drop shipping. They do drop shipping. They sell the first two items. The next thing they become, they become discouraged. They dump it. You must be committed to whatever it is you set out to do because people are watching. People want to be sure that you are who you say you are. The next thing I'm going to encourage you to do is to go digital and go big digitally. Then this is not the time to start to explain why you should go digital. If you are not playing in the digital space today, I really don't know what you are doing. Seven billion people are waiting to encounter you. How many of them are you marketing to? How many of them know you? How many of them are you pushing your brand out there to? It is the biggest market ever in the digital space. There are no restrictions. So you must go digital. Use influencers to gain traction. That's another thing I did. I, I wrote on the shoulders of influencers. I didn't just come on the digital space. If I could check, number of followers on Instagram is very low. But those followers count. I use influencers. An influencer mentions my brand and I sell out. I, I pay an influencer to post, make a post for me. The minute he makes that post, I sell out. That's what I do. I may not have followers. I may never have people in my DM, but I have people crediting my account and that's what matters. While you continue to build organically and being digital means you must show up. Some of us are very good at writing. If you are good at writing, why are you not putting out content there? Why don't you have a blog? Keep posting, keep appearing, keep being visible. Someday, brands are going to connect with you and partner with you and make your journey a lot easier. But you don't have to be on all platforms. There are some platforms that work for you. Some platforms work for your clients. Choose your platforms. Speak the language of that platform. Be committed to that platform. Show up and focus on it. In all of this, I am assuming you've already set up your financial plan. If you've not set up your financial plan, there's nothing more to say to you. Please just go and set it up. Because it is your financial plan. If you work with a financial planner, it is your financial plan that will show you the path. 
and it makes life a lot easier. So please set up your financial plan. And I'll begin to wrap up by saying, you need to have, this is my recommendation and I found out that it works. You need to have at least two products, a physical product and a digital product. You need to have at least two services a physical service and a digital service, whatever it is you are doing. If you have these four streams of income, you will never be in crisis. I am a living proof. While the world was screaming about the pandemic, in fact, I grew during the pandemic. It was during the pandemic that I launched my, my the first two books I published were during the pandemic. The other two were post-pandemic. I sold out, I made profit from my book launch. I, I have been, I'm a product, when people are screaming of pandemic, the pandemic blessed me. And why did it do that? Because I was able to quickly pivot. I was able to adopt new strategies. So I learned, I learned the hard way that the plans you have for your business, because the plans I have for my business were big plans. I plan to get a nice office. Thank God I did not try it. I plan to have a nice office. I plan to have staff. I had support. I had, if you see my first complimentary card, I can't stop talking about it. It was fire. Nowadays, I don't even know what complimentary card is. The one I have now, I don't know where it is. I've moved on. But I was able to pivot and generate streams of income that had very little to do with a physical presence. Now, if you need me to appear physically, you are going to have to pay a huge premium for me to do so. So ensure that you have those four streams of income. And as you grow, each of them should have a backup. In all of this, you must be very conscious of your costs. You know, when you're in paid employment, you get paid a salary, whether you meet your targets or not, whether the company meets targets or not, you get paid a salary. When you leave paid employment, the story changes. You are going to be your own security guard, you'll be your receptionist, you'll be your customer service person, you'll be your own marketer, you'll be your own trumpeter, you'll be everything because you'll be trying to manage costs. Then the business grows to the point where you, the business can now take over. So you must learn to manage costs. If you are still in paid employment, this is the time to begin to understand numbers and begin to understand the process of managing costs. Finally, I'll wrap up by saying most people become depressed. Most people become despondent. Most people even become, become, most people even become suicidal when they lose their jobs or when they get out of paid employment or when they leave paid employment and things don't work out or they lose money when things don't work out. Here's my recommendation. As you plan to quit your job, or if you've already quit, or you've already left paid employment, learn to be a person of value. Be relevant. Money follows value. People will give you value in exchange of value. Be a person of value. Be up to date. Find out what the market wants. And develop yourself to be one of the best at providing what the market wants. If you do that, you'll make money. Because for your post-9 to 5 job, you need money and you need relevance. If you have those two, your retirement or post nine to five journey will be a thrill and a work in the park. In a walk in the park, it can be very rewarding. But you need to put in the work. And believe me, if you put in the work, after your nine to five, life will be a lot sweeter. Life will be totally at your beck and call. You can choose to be whatever you want, be whomever you want, and the world will be listening to hear your voice. It's a lovely journey, but you need to put in the work. Thank you very much for your time. And it's over to you, Obon. Thank you very much, Tobor. You've blessed my day already. I have this full sheet of uh, snippets I've written down. Um, please, I, I, I appreciate you as a person and as a teacher. And I've... I've uh, um, learned a lot from you today. Even this last point you mentioned that learn to be a person of value. One of my mentors said to me, you would go from who do you know to who knows you to who are you, all right? When you start out in life, when you start out in life, people ask, who do you know? I know the commissioner of police. I know the, I know Fashola, I know, 
then you graduate to who knows you. At times you call the fashion line, he doesn't think you're called. You know him, maybe you are in the same church group or something, and he doesn't know you. So you get to the point where he knows you, and then you become a person of value. Who are you? When your name is mentioned, just like if you mention a Tinubu today, a Peter or B, or a Dangote, or you know, these people have carved out niches for themselves. So being a person of value, um, unclogging your mind. Um, the other point you brought up that um, paid employment is an opportunity to make big people. And, you know, I, I, I used to have a saying when I was in the banking sector, and I tell people no farmer goes to the field placing a curse on his, on his uh, product. So why do you say this company is a useless company and you expect to profit from it? So I, I sat in a seat where I made mistakes. Um, I can remember when I cost, I, we lost a, a foreign check of almost about a million dollars in transit. Something happened. I learned a lesson. You know, it cost us about 10 million naira, but the, it was a valuable lesson. We recovered it somewhere, but it was an opportunity for me to learn. It was school fees for, you know, if I'd gone to maybe a business school, I wouldn't learn it. Even my MD then called me and said, look, you become more valuable when you do things like this, because I know you will not make this mistake a second time. So having a backup plan, writing down things and not just to mentally have them. You know, people think when I come out, this is how I have marketers, I have cars, I have a big office. Write things down. If when you write your plans down, you begin to critique it a lot more. And then uh, learn to pay for information. I don't know, Nigerians, we like a lot of free things. We need to, um, you know, this seminar is free. Thank God for the organizers. But when you want to take it a step beyond this, you need to be able to pay. Plan your day. Don't wake up every day thinking you're on vacation. Because that's how you feel. I can remember the first day I woke up after I resigned from paid employment. I woke up staring at the ceiling. I was asking myself, what next now? You know, so you must have a plan. Go digital. You must have two products. One, um, a physical and a digital product. So I appreciate um, all those points. Thank you very much, madam. Um, I would like to introduce the second speaker. Um, his name is uh, John Yena. He's, uh, I know a lot of us are familiar with the company um, Trips, which formerly was known as uh, Plenty Walker. He's a, he's a founder of, uh, of that company. He's a major stakeholder of that company. He says also as uh, the president of TRIPS. He also is a business mentor to a lot of uh, upcoming entrepreneurs. So without much ado and further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Johnny Enna. Uh, you're welcome, sir, to this platform. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a um, <laughs> pleasure to actually come on this platform. Tubori, well done. I really enjoyed the session. Where are you, where are you, where are you from? Horrible. Oh, yeah. So when I saw the Tubori, I said, okay, this is my, this is my personal we... person. <laughs> Good this to meet you, too. Thank you very much. Um, I actually hear from um, um, the Delta um, side from Isoko North. Um, Precisely. Uh, so well done. Thank you. Uh, I followed up through the, the session and I really um, um, learned a lot of things um, at first. So thank you for, for that. Um, thanks, guys, for having me here. Um, Tobari has actually laid the foundation. So I don't want to go through um, what's it called, um, everything she has spoken about, right? So I'm just going to build up for from where where um, the funded from the foundation she has laid, and um, my approach this afternoon is going to be um, 
um, talking more about my personal experience um, and because I have a lot I, I have been through and um, that has become a template for people to build on and learn from that template. Um, yeah, so once again, thank you um, guys for having me here. I really appreciate this um, and um, we'll take this from granted, all right? So let me dive in. First and foremost, my name is um, Johnny and a lot of people call me Johnny and about the actual name is actually Enagwolo. Um, I was, um, I hear from Delta State, um, from a polygamous home where we are 27 in number. Um, my, I am a product of um, a fling. So I'm going to be going in depth of my background so that you understand where I'm coming from. <clears throat> a product of a fling from a place where um, I have an uncle who was owing my dad and um, um, he couldn't pay my dad the money. So one day he took my mom to go and beg uh, my dad. And my dad saw my mom and said, okay, um, since you can't pay me my money, who is this lady that came with you? And um, he said, okay, I'm going to have her and um, you um, write, knock off maybe 30, 40% of the money you are owing me. And, and that was how they forced my mom um, into one night stand with my dad. I don't hate my dad. I loved him so much before he died though. Um, but yeah, um, it happened and um, I showed forth. Um, when my dad finally knew my mom was pregnant, um, it was a chaos. I came with a lot of um, maltreatment. Um, my mom, my, my dad denied the pregnancy. Um, they bought all kinds of pills for my mom to um, get rid of my get rid of me, and nothing worked. Um, my mom was abandoned. My uncle also abandoned my mom from a place where. Um, why would you be so careless? <clears throat> Anyways, that happened, and finally I came forth into this um, this um, this world. All right, um, I was with my mom as a like as a single mother. I grew up with my mom, and things were really tough because I remember the few ones I can remember where um, I would have to start going to neighbors' houses to beg for food because we couldn't feed. My mom would send me, go and beg. Anything they give to you, bring and we eat together. Those kind of things happened. Um, from there, my mom started um, when I was, when I was um, seven, eight years old, I was already hawking, um, hawking granite for my mom, hawking oranges for my mom. So any seasonal fruits, you know, we just hawk them. We buy and we start hawking. So I was one of, the person doing all of that for my mom and combining that with um schooling all right um but one thing that was that was a driver for me is that when i saw where i'm coming from and i saw um rich kids let me put it that way there was this there, there's this thing that drives me from the inside that hey i need to my kids will look like these kids that I'm seeing today. So that was a driver for me. And um, I grew up to a point where I think when I was 10, my dad came for me and um, came to take me. Fast forward down the line, my mom accepted and then got me back to, and got me back, uh, took me back. My dad took me back um, into his house. Um, I went to my dad's house. It was so hostile there because my mom wasn't in a home. I will have 27 other kids. It was survival of the fittest again, where my stepmom were all about treating me. If you don't, if you miss a meal, you have missed that meal for the day. You know, where um, they, even when there is food, they won't give it, to, they, won't, I won't, they won't give me food. It was that bad. And I can't run back to my mom because my mom didn't have food either to give to me. So some days I would do, um, zero one zero 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 one or one zero zero. That was my meal order, and um, at some point I just I was just focus reading my books and all of that, and uh, see how I can just um, I see myself just leaving that whole brouhaha of what I was facing in my early days. So I did that throughout my um, elementary schools and. Um, 
went into the University, University of Benin and um, came out of the university and um, um, went back to Delta State, that's Ugeli. Um, so one morning, um, this is where the journey started. One morning I woke up and told my dad, um, I want to, um, so there was a part I missed. I, I did entrance exam when I was in NYC and I got into Oshonic Bank. When I got into Oshonic Bank in Ugeli, I was in Oshonic Bank as um, cash and teller, um, where I was just counting money, customers' money, and um, when I was counting customers' money, there were things that were happening in the bank that was that made me wonder. Uh, um, so, for instance, we are counting money, we want to post money, and the system goes down, and they tell us um, um, we don't know what to do, and they say, ah, "You guys are going to wait. Um, head office has to respond." And every time I head head office has to respond. So I walked up to my branch manager one day. I said, who is in this head office? Why are they controlling everything? Why can't we control these things from, you know, our local office here? And um, so when you ask them, they can't even, they don't even have solution for, for resolving some of those issues we, we go through. So every time they call the head office, head office, head office. So one day I just woke up and I said, you see this head office? I think I want to go to this head office. That is where I belong, where they are controlling things. That is where I want to go. So I woke up one morning, I told my dad, Daddy, I want to go to head office. My dad said, where is head office? I said, our head office is in Lagos. My dad said, who do you know in Lagos? I said, I don't know anybody in Lagos, but I just want to go to a place where the things are happening. He said, really? I said, yes. He said, but you know, you don't know anybody, you're going to suffer, blah, blah, blah. And um, to cut the long story short, I left... Um, um, I have to um, apply for my transfer and I got it and um, boom, I came to Lagos in 2002 where, and I came to head office. When I got into the head office, the first question I, I asked them was like, where in this head office do they control all our software? And all? They laughed. They said, why am I asking? Because I said, ah, anytime our system is down, we are always, they're always saying something which you, they want to call head office. They want to call head office. So they said, okay, I should go to IT room. They directed me to the IT room. And I went to the IT room and I saw a few guys working in the IT room. I said, ah. So is these people that have been controlling all, all our destiny that we'll be waiting for? And I even saw some of them eating. I said, wow, in my mind. So when we're actually having this, some of them are even eating. And we're just, oh my God. I said, this life is not balanced at all. So immediately I saw that. I said, no, this is where I belong. This ha I have to grow in this head office. And just to fast forward down the line, opportunities came that I grabbed. Um, um, they set up, um, the, the, uh, they wanted to set up an e-business unit. I grabbed it and um, I was one of those that started the first e-business unit in Oshonic Bank in Nigeria. And from there, I went to strategic planning, but I was now focused more on e-business and uh, product development. And I didn't study anything around e-business and product development. It was just a drive um, from, um, on, my, uh, on the inside of me that just made me to say, oh, everything, every opportunity out that I see, I just want to grab it. I wasn't satisfied. I was always you know, hungry for more. And um, that was what just, was just driving me. So I, from e-business, I met the likes of... Um, um, uh, Mitchell and Legbe, when they started InterSwitch, you know, for from Turner, they started InterSwitch. I met the likes of um, um, Valentine Obi that started eTransact. I met the likes of um, um, Agada that started Unified Payment, now becoming, um, uh, now partnering with Visa in Nigeria. So I met all of these guys when their businesses were still um, more um, in the ideation stage and all of that. And um, they launched their businesses. And um, some of the things I did with them were very impressive. And the um, um, management commended me for all that we did. And um, when I did all of that, I became one of those that um, deployed one of the first um, automated teller machines in the country then, and also deployed the first e-ticketing solution in Nigeria, which was um, Aero um, e-ticketing. Fast forward down the line, in nine years, I rose to the flanks to become an AGM um, in banking. What takes people about 25 years, 30 years to achieve 
It took me nine years to achieve it. And that was because of the hunger in me um, to want more, um, to, to make things happen. Everything I was doing were novel ideas I was bringing up. When I, well, I remember when I came up with the e-ticketing solution, my, my MD, Cecilia Ibri, told me, Johnny, if this thing doesn't work, you are sacked. Why? Because we're about to spend about 2.8 million there. I can't forget. We got an approval for 2.8 million to launch a product. Because of 2.8 million, somebody told me I was going to sack. I told him, no problem, man. If it doesn't work, fire me. However, if it works, you will give me double promotion. He, she laughed. And we did e-ticketing for aero contractors. In one month, we turned over over 20 million for e-ticketing. Then, before then, people go to the airport and you have long queues of people buying um, flight tickets. That was all that was happening. Sometimes people go to the banks to buy those tickets. But I saw this gap and I felt, no, this has to be done. And a couple of other things I was doing in the bank that I wasn't getting royalties, I wasn't getting um, paid for them. At some point when I became an AGM, I said, no, I think I've given so much into um, the banking world. So when um, um, CBN came up with, um, um, what was it called? Um, um, the cashless um, policy um, thing. Uh, I told my boss then that, see, I don't believe in this thing, that this is another white elephant project, you know, that is a waiting time bomb. That I mean, um, I really don't believe that. Then I was in um, Stambik IBTC. So I got into Stambik, uh, Standard Bank, South Africa, before I came back to Nigeria to Stambik IBTC. So I spoke to my NB and she said, ah, Johnny, no, we should just align and adhere to what CBN is saying. And I said, I don't believe in it. This is going to fail. So because of that singular thing, I have to resign. And I resigned from the place where I felt I've given it all into um, in banking. I would, there was no fulfillment anymore. It's like I've seen it all in banking. So I resigned. That was where the beginning of sorrow started. When I resigned, I started my entrepreneurial journey where I went into um, agriculture and um, we're producing um, floating fish feed. We're one of those that started it in Niger Delta, producing floating fish feeds for catfish. Um, to cut the long story short, the business was grounded because of mismanagement from a place where um, I didn't get the right people I didn't get the right talents um, to do the business with me. I didn't have structure. I had finances because I've saved a lot of money from banking. Then I've saved up to about 30 million. I flew to China to buy machineries, brought them to Nigeria, brought um, the expatriates to come here to even train people and all of that. I had funding, but having the wrong people in your business sometimes can kill your business very fast in a twinkling of an eye. And having to also go for mediocrity where you're not going for the best of talent that have, um, what's it called, um, um, uh, related um, expertise or experience in what you're doing is also something we want you to go into. So I build that business around friends and family. And when I did that, the business crumbled. The business had a boom, but it crumbled very fast. When that business crumbled, my world came down. This was somebody that I was used to, you know, doing, um, um, uh, what's it called? Um, doing trips with my family. They were used to traveling and all of that, all of a sudden, there was no money in the house anymore to do all of those bullshit. Let me call them bullshit because at some point, it was like, it was like everything just went, went dark. I remember my wife would ask me, what is the plan? I tell my wife, I really don't know yet. I remember sometimes I would have to go and look into the suits I've worn in a long time to actually um, search to get to get money from, from those suits. Things went so bad that at some point I felt, okay, how do we get out of this? 
that was when I went into my closet. I said, okay, I have expertise in e-business. What else can I do? I have, I have articulated everything that made me to fail in my previous businesses. And I said, okay, what is the way forward? I told my wife, I want to go into transportation. My wife said, do you have money? Where are you going to get money from? You have not been able to even raise 10,000. You want to go into transportation that, is, um, that has huge capital outlay. I told him I want to drive Keke. She went, you know, <laughs> she went over the bar like, are you kidding me? I said, yes, that's what I want to do. He said, you want to drive Keke? I said, yes. I said, because I heard some people saying that you make a lot of money from Keke. He said, how much do they make? I said, I don't know, but I want to test it. So I spoke to a friend, um, a mentor who gave me 700,000 naira. I used that 700,000 naira to buy my first keke after my wife allowed me to do it. I drove the keke in Lagos for about three weeks. I was driving that keke. When I'm driving that keke, I will mask, I will mask up as in nobody will know I'm the one. There was a lady that caught me one day. I said, Johnny, is this you? And she busted into tears. Me too, I started crying because I didn't know my life would be so depleted to this level. I drove that keke for um, three weeks. And what I got from that keke was that in every, every week of that, uh, um, every week I was making about 35,000 naira from keke when I was driving it. So I was able to save 25,000 every week from driving the keke. So in a month, I was making 100,000. So that month I can give my wife 50K to take care of the home. And it was better, for, better than where we're coming from. And that ended when I said, okay, this keke makes a lot of sense. And there is no structure. You have to manage operators. How do I scale this business? So immediately I was already thinking of scaling the business. I said, there are a whole lot of people that are working in the office space that want to actually invest in keke. Perhaps because of the way the place is managed, with lack of, you know, um, uh, uh, what's called um, um, di digital, digital application, where they cannot track, you know, metrics as it affects number of rides and bookings and revenue generated. I said, okay, I need to put a structure in place. So I, 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 I went to Instagram, created an Instagram page, created a Facebook page, did a sponsored ad, the name of the company. I set up a, a company called Fericon. We started marketing the Fericon. We started getting people who were investing in us and we were paying them weekly return on their investment. It was so sweet to them that people who did one keke increased to two kekes, increased to three keke. To so fast forward down the line, in one and a half years, we have done over 300 kekes flying at the road and, um, and uh, Shango Tedo. That was how we were running that business at that time before the ban on keke came. And that place went down again. When the ban on keke came, we have to move. Okay, what's the next plan? With the little money we got, we went to buy Korokwe. And you, some of you know the Korokwe buses, those small buses that you, know, you have to squeeze yourself in. I bought the Korokwe and I drove the Korokwe myself for one month. This is the person when people see me in church, they come to beg me money. They don't know that I, I have driven Keke and I've driven Korokwe. When I drove the Korokwe, when I saw the return, Korokwe I was making about 35,000. We grow Korokwe from one to about 80. It was when I was driving the Korokwe business that somebody told me that, ah, Oga, no, they were just just behind me when I was driving. And somebody mentioned, why don't we just have, must we be fighting to, to um, what's it called, um, um, enter a bus on, all the time? And they were just, say, ah, I tell you, the government can even provide AC buses, they can't even provide anything. And that was when I caught the vision to say, oh, this is another gap in this transportation space. And right now, over 9 million people that commute in Lagos actually go through these hazards just to access public transportation. I remember there was a time when we get to a bus stop, we have only one seat available. Yet you have like 20 people waiting, you know, to, 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 to use the bus service. So when the bus stops, you see people pulling the bus, pulling everything. Many occasions they have pulled, they even pulled the door out of the bus.
just to get into the bus. So that was why I said, okay, I think this is an opportunity, a huge opportunity and nobody is doing this. This is a, a novel idea and I think I want to explore it. What do I need to do? I want a situation whereby people from the comfort of their homes can actually have access to their phones, to, a, to an app, see the number of buses coming to their, uh, coming to their bus stop, see the number of seats available and book those um, uh, book um, uh, book the bus and the driver will see the the the, the rider that has booked the bus um, um, at the designated bus stop immediately i thought about that something struck johnny you have to get this right this time around no more cutting corners and i said how do i get a strategic partner that i'm going to do this with and I saw somebody who has been a digital beast um, in the digital space, and I partnered with him to do this. And in 2019, um, 2019, 2016, we launched a business called Plenty Worker, a platform that allows um, you to use technology to power, um, to, to enhance um, 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 and the movement of daily commuters on a daily basis. Today, the business has grown, um, just to fast forward down the line, the business has grown from a place where we have moved from, from um, just launching in Nigeria. We have moved to Ghana. We have moved to um, Uganda. We're about to launch Dubai in, um, um, in uh, October. And our head office currently is in Toronto. In the last um, two years plus, the business also, because of the strategic positioning, and get into some of the accelerators program, we've been able to raise over $4.8 million um, as we speak today. So that is my story, but what has made this business succeed? I'm just gonna talk about that a bit. And I think um, um, Tobori also spoke um, about, um, uh, spoke on uh, some of those um, points. First and foremost, for you to even start any business, there has to be a hunger in you, a hunger to make impact. It is very, very key. I see people who are laid back today say there's nothing to do. I have launched two other businesses after trips that have raised over $2 million today. I've launched a business um, um, around um, the health space. I've launched a business around um, um, the uh, real estate space. Today, we're about to launch a business around education and also um, 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 on, um, uh, what's it called, uh, entertainment. These are also in the pipeline that we're trying to um, um, work on. Some of those things have happened over time. Why? Because of the hunger to make impact, to create something new. Because I'm, when I, if I enter your house, if I enter your means, I'm already looking for problems, problems to solve. And I'm already looking at how I'm going to digitize what the, what the problem is. That is what I think. Every day I go out, every day I go um, um, to social gatherings. I'm thinking outside the bus to see what can I do differently. And the MD of Textiles Toronto um, traveled to um, Textiles, um, um, the MD of Textiles globally. I remember she came to Lagos about three weeks ago and she said, Johnny, I want to travel around Nigeria with you because they just set up Textiles Accelerator in Nigeria. And he told me, Johnny, in the next five years, I want to make 10 unicorns out of Africa, five mostly from Nigeria. Johnny, I need you to give me names of the next unicorn, unicorn that will emerge from Nigeria. I'm currently working on that right now. Everywhere I go to, I, told, I tell people, do you have a brilliant idea? Bring it on, let me hear it. Let's see how we can, how we can uh, accelerate this idea to the global stage. So the hunger kept me going. Two, people, when I wanted to start Plenty Worker, I didn't, want, I didn't want to mess around with the kind of people I'm going to be bringing on board. So I brought somebody who was good with the digital um, thing, um, uh, 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 in the digital space. I brought another person who was good, who is our CTO, who is good with technology. I brought another person who was good in uh, product development. We all came together to build this. We brought in our expertise and we're building this together. And it's been fun because everybody has something to contribute at every point in time. Today, we have built a business where we are partnering with 
major um, 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 major partner like state governments, um, presidents of different countries, just to scale this business. By next month, the president of Yamaha is coming into Lagos just to come to Lagos, and we are striking a major partnership with Yamaha next month. So these are a couple of things that have helped us, and I go for the best of talents. I don't even compromise that. So yes, that is my story so far. I'm sure uh, one or two persons will have questions, um, I mean, to ask. I prefer to go this route because uh, Tobori has actually done a lot, you know, so I wanted to just build on that by telling my wow. story. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, guys. No bloody way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Honestly. Whoa, I would have stood, but you won't see me standing. Wow. <laughs> wow. 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 I didn't know the story. I'm going Thank to ask you very question. much. If I, yeah. anybody says anything, let me drag this piece. All right. Johnny, have you written your stories? So, don't worry. I haven't written my story yet. All right. Now let me give you, let me give you, let me tell you something. Uh, let me tell you something that happened recently. So I took my story to Facebook recently, right? To just give my story. And um, I did it in an episode. And as I speak to you right now, I started that story like um, a month ago. And I've written like five episodes. Do you know what happened? After I did that on Facebook and LinkedIn, people started, people told me they want to. Um, they want an ebook of my story. All right. So I came back to people to say, okay, I want to write my story now, but I'm not going to use my money to rewrite my story. So if you want to get my story, I need you to commit to the ebook for $5 per copy. And as I speak to you today, we have raised $7,000 already. So currently, we are currently working on the story right now. Now we're going to probably by the end of the month. As posterity Ooh. will judge you badly if that story is not written. I know there are, there are going to be more books. Yeah. This is probably volume one. The rest of your life will be volume 20 up to that. But volume one has to go down. Thank Please. you. Thank, Thank you. you very I'm much. I'm working on that. I'm working on that. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Johnny. Honestly, you know, I've been looking at you from afar. This story has humbled me. I need to, you know, there's so much of things to learn. And at a point, I couldn't write again. Thank God the thing is recorded so I can play it again and watch it. Okay? So it is really an honor to have you on this platform. Thank, um, you. thank you very much for blessing us with your presence. Um, we are so, 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 so grateful you are here. Thank you, sir. Pleasure, sir. Sorry, Mr. Obon, can I, can I quickly just step in? Okay. Okay, sir. Yes. Um, in fact, I'm short of words. <laughs> you know, I've never heard this part, though. Yeah. I know a bit. I know a bit. I'm saying that I just know a bit. At least I know from the real estate to an extent and then a few other things. But Wow. I'm feeling very pain now that most of the people who registered for this event are not here. We had quite a good number of registered, but without people doing with Zoom, people often don't turn up. They sort of take it for granted when it's free. I am wishing I had a lot more people who are here listening to this. So right on this platform in public, I'm asking you that we're going to put something together, um, something bigger and stronger, and I'll get back to you. I want to push Jesus to a lot of people need to hear this. It is an That's impressive right. story, impressive story on how you can move from paid employment to successful entrepreneur. It's not a smooth story, but it's definitely the most inspiring story. So um, I'm sort of putting you on the spot by getting your yes now. <laughs> if, I come, <laughs> if I come to see you one on one. I don't so, know if you mind, so if you mind if you, going on. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to, um, if you want to do that, also let me know because um, definitely, so definitely. there are a couple of countries who want to um we want to launch all right so i'll be doing a lot of traveling um no problem so, we'll um, the time. part of what let me just chip this in i, I know um i'm running out uh, my time is up but let please me just... you can go on you can go on take my time <laughs> <laughs> what is time <laughs> take my time <laughs> please, please, take my time there was something that happened um, there was something that happened some time ago many years back around uh, um that was 20 2017 all right 
I had a friend who was about to relocate to Canada, uh, more like a childhood friend. And when he was leaving, there's this, you know, emotion like, ah, Johnny, I'm going to leave you. So he said, okay, somebody help them to do um, work the whole Canada uh, relocation stuff and all of that to apply for PR. So my wife said, ah, let's try it now. Ah, let's try it. Maybe uh, it's something we can do. Um, so we went, they took us there and the people told us that um, um, to relocate to Canada, um, to do the PR, uh, then you're going to be spending about um, 1.7 million initial, uh, initially. Then after you get it, you're going to raise another seven, um, around seven or eight million again. And then we didn't have one there. My wife immediately under the table, she just stepped on my feet, mashed my feet, said, let us leave. We can't, we can't do this. It was so embarrassing when I told the guy, we're not doing again. Few years fast forward and like when we started this business. So sometimes I always tell people, see, don't limit yourself. Yeah. And yeah. don't stay in one craft for too long. If it is not working, it's not working. Don't stay. I have done a couple of things in the last 10 years. You, 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 you mentioned about real estate. I have done a lot of things just to make sure something is working. I've done networking. I've done anything you can think of. Uh, once it brings money, I want to do it. If it's a novel, like I want to go into it. So when we started this business, something happened. We qualified into um, Texas, Toronto. Immediately we qualified into Texas, Toronto. Y Combinator reached out to, to me and said, hey, we need you in Y Combinator. And I said, oh, we already have Texas. Why community started begging us? We need you, please. Don't do this to us. But eventually, we dumped Y community. I went to Texas, Toronto. Immediately, we entered Texas, Toronto. We became one of the best startups that entered into the, um, um, one of the cohorts. The mayor of Brampton sent for us. We couldn't travel them because it was COVID, uh, post, um, um, post-COVID and it was still locked down. So we're doing this um, virtually. The mayor of Brampton had a meeting with us. This is same people, so, uh, the same person that wanted to travel initially that couldn't go. The mayor of Brampton reached out to me that, see, we love your business. We want you to launch your business in Brampton in Ontario. We said, wow. He said, you know what I'm going to do? We're going to file in for your work permits and your PR. So they did that on our behalf. After they filed for our work permit, the mayor of Brampton told us something. He said, you see, I am going to give you guys a house in Brampton because I want you guys to stay in Brampton so that you don't go to any other place in Canada. Where am I driving at? Because we made a move, some of these doors opened. Sometimes I see a lot of people, when I was in banking, a lot of people are scared to, to resign, are scared to make the next move because they, 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 they're so used to their comfort zone. I always tell people, where you know that you are used to your comfort zone is when you start getting old. You understand that the fulfillment that you have been looking, you're no longer getting it. And I'm going to just end on this note one. And my father used to tell me this, and this is how I approach life generally. I, I do everything with the speed of light because I feel that my father used to tell me, if you, if you have 100 years to live in this world, all right, see it like you have only 10 years to execute everything you want to do. Why did he say so? When you were born into this world, when you are one, when you born, when you were born into this world, you started um, feeding, breastfeeding. Later, you started walking, and they celebrate your one year birthday. Immediately, they celebrate your one year birthday. That child is starting school. Immediately, that child starts school. You are clocking ten years, and when that child clocks ten years, the next thing the child is. The, 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 the next, uh, 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 what's it called, uh, landmark is going to be um, um, 20 years. And when you get to 20, before you know it, you are 30. I remember when I was 20 and I was 30. Before 30, you're already going to 40. There's really no time. We call it decades. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole decade. But there's really no time in between. So things need to work with the speed of life to achieve a whole lot of stuff. My, 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 first, my first child today is 12 years old. I remember when we gave birth to, I was still full of, you know, live, everything. But now we have discussions together. 
I have to start even introducing her into the entrepreneurial space. So she makes beads and starts selling beads right now. She goes to church and harass everybody that cares to listen in church to buy her beads. So that hunger to, 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 to succeed, because for me, by the time I'm 50, I want to ensure that I'm in my retirement stage already, that I'm not doing so much um, or, or, or I'm, I'm doing so much around doing um, 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 nine to five um, um, work anymore. So right now I'm building businesses, I'm partnering with people to launch businesses out there. That is the hunger I have. And that is the hunger everybody needs to have. If you are doing something that is not working, quit or remodel the business. We started with ride hailing, um, bus hailing when we started. We became the first um, a business to commence to launch bus hailing in Nigeria. After we launched bus hailing, we discovered that staff trips, a lot of staff were coming to meet us to move their staff for staff bus solution. We created another product out of that. I was started moving staff. Today, we have over 15 corporates in our book, including MTN, Wakana, our multi choice that will move their staff and even take us part. After that, we saw government coming to us that, hey, our parks, we are having operational issues with um, day to day, um, um, uh, our day to day operation. Can you guys give us a? We created another enterprise solution from that. We deploy enterprise solution, we call it Park Solution for Parks. Our solution is what is driving TNM um, um, parks in um, at CMS today. Our solution is driving their park in Nasara State. Our solution is driving parks in Aquaibom. Our solution is driving parks across, across Nigeria and even in Ghana and in Uganda today. Why? Because of the feedbacks we get, immediately we sense it, we are building a product around it. You cannot afford to stay in one place. You, you have to keep on moving. You have to have the hunger to keep on developing. Once you do, because I've during the course of this my my entrepreneurial journey, I've met with the major CEOs of big brand, name them, um, Facebook. This um, what's it called? Um, um, the CEO of Facebook came to my office. Different CEOs have been to my office in the in the last in the last three years, and we've had sincere, honest discussions in the process. And I've discovered that they really don't have two heads; they just see a gap, and they just key into that and they make the billions of dollars they are making. We need to move fast. When we launched Plenty Waka, the MD of GTB came to me and I said, ah, Johnny, Johnny, come, 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 come. Let me show you my laptop. You open his laptop. See now, see this product. I was, I thought about it. See now, I've built everything, but we couldn't launch. When you have an idea, don't let it sit on the inside of you. Share it with your mentors and try to roll it out very, very fast. And when you do that, there's a first mobile advantage for every product. Quick to market. <clears throat> Once you go there, you go there on time because you want to be number one. So when you do that, you can only be number one and enjoy all the glory of being the, uh, having the first mobile advantage. Yeah, I dropped my pen here. Take a first mobile advantage. I will move in to call you. <laughs> wow. Whoa! I will do parapo. I don't think I. I don't think I have anything to say after this. Oh, well, thank God! Start. Thank God I didn't speak after Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so, so you know where I'm sitting. I'm not sure I have anything to say again. No. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and it's almost time. So probably this is 10, 11, 26. We're supposed to wrap for 12 o'clock. Um, so I'm thinking, Mr. Obong, I'm wondering if we could just have q and A. I don't think I should be talking. I don't know what else. I don't. I really am not sure. Um, most of what he, he has I said everything. <laughs> both, both he and Tobo have Let's said everything. Yes. Let's share in fact, some of the things I was going to say, Johnny has said it in practical terms. I was going to share some things on, on the theoretical part, but yeah, I said it in very practical terms. So yeah. I don't know what I should be um, talking about again. I don't think you can add flesh to what already has flesh. So I think I, I think we should do the Q&A session. What do you think, MD? I think we can start off with the Q&A. Uh, let's have our audience. People can also mention, if anybody thinks, we can also just, we can just go into the Q&A. So if you do have questions, please, Start putting it up out in the chat room. 
So, if you have so, questions um, for Johnny and um, Tuboe, let's start talking and throwing a question. Before, let me start. Okay, okay yes. I have a question for the panelists. Um, while they were talking, I, I noted here, how do you monetize your gifts or talents? Um, because a lot of people have talents and they give it out for free. It is when you now want to charge money for it that you now find out that it's a different ball game. Very so true. how do you monetize your talents, your gifts, or et cetera? Thank you. Okay, should I, Mr. Johnny, are you going to go? Can I go? Uh, yeah, anyone, anybody can go first, it's fine. Okay, so let me say quickly on this. For this, I think one of the ways you monetize your gift, your gift or your talent, first of all, is in it's raw material. Nobody will pay for your gift or your talent. So your gift or your talent has to become a product. People pay for products, not for your gift. So if your gift or your talent is not a product, nobody will pay for it. And in a product, you must understand that a product must be given a specific value, you know, to a specific need. It's addressing a specific need for a specific group of people who can obviously afford to pay. So if you have a gift or a talent and you sort of have been saving it for free, now you want to want people to pay for it. You need to move it from that place. You need to now move it into a product, especially, for example, if it's a service product. So for me, uh, for a while, for a long time, I gave out my talents for free in terms of being able to sit down with people and have them decide on what they want to do, being able to turn an idea into a business or a product. I did that for a lot of people. They went on to start their businesses and I was left hanging, you know, and it looked at me, but at some point I turned it into a product. So for under my consulting company, Meetwork, we have now what we call a retainership service where the same thing I was doing for some people for free. Now I charge as much as 500,000 to do that same thing for some people over a period of time. And I've had people pay, but it wasn't so, it wasn't so easy for a while. When I started, when I talked to people about paying for it, I was talking to the wrong people. When I told somebody, come and pay me 100000 let me work with you to help turn your business, I mean, to help turn your idea into a product and set up the business, a working structure. The guy looked at me like, are you joking? 100 k for what? What will you do for me? What are you going to do that I do not know? Blah, 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 blah. It took a while. But I started understanding that after turning it into a product, I was talking to the wrong people, the wrong market. People were not willing to pay for it. So I had to start looking at a moving location. And then when I started talking to the people who saw the value in it and they could pay, suddenly the same thing, I was begging somebody to pay 100,000 for. Somebody was willing to pay 250, straight up. And it was an eye opener. So for me, I think to, for that to monetize your gift or your talent, first of all, it needs to become a product. If it's not a product, nobody will pay for it. Because a product means it has value, it is the need is going to address a specific, there's a cost to it, people can quickly relate and they can put their hands in their pocket or in their bank and transfer to you. And then also you need to then be talking to the right people, people who actually need it, one, and people who can afford to pay, preferably people who can pay premium on what you are offering, you know, and uh, or it's even better sometimes to offer it free to people who have the potential to pay than to offer it to people who cannot even ever pay at all. You know, it's a lose lose at the end of the day. So that's my that's my thought. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, might I also add, Uber, before, and, and I'm going to talk about people who have talents and are currently sitting in paid employment space or in a space that is inferior to where they think they can be better. You need to put your talent in its refined state, which is similar to what Tim has said. So for some people, you are good at speaking, for instance, or you are good at talking, for instance. I say to people all the time, talk is cheap. Nobody pays you to talk, but people will pay you to speak. So if you can refine the same thing as a talent, but like Tim also said, it's raw. If you can put it in a state that someone will say, oh, okay, I'm willing to pay this for it. Put it in that form, then demand. See, if you are working for Nigerians, you need to demand a payment. But people need to even know, yes, people need to know that you would have the talent. So put it out there, but don't give all. Put, put out teasers. For instance, most people, when I first started, 
financial planning. I spoke for free. I almost died of free giving. I spoke across <laughs> platforms. I but I needed. Why was I speaking for free? For different reasons. I needed to sharpen my skill. I needed mm. to test the reception in the market, and I needed to put my name out there. Then I also needed feedback from the market. And I needed the documentation. I needed to be able to say, oh, I've spoken in Shell, I've spoken in Total, I've spoken in... I needed it for my portfolio. That was the reason why it was. So it wasn't free in quotes. They were giving me their names to put in my portfolio. Mm -hmm. But the minute I had a bit of that, and there's always supposed to be a timeline. So you put yourself out there, keep putting out your content. Then when it is time to demand, you must demand it. So I, and you put a premium on it. If I'm saying I'm charging 100,000 Naira for 30 minutes, for instance, if you come to me that you want to pay for 30 minutes, if you don't have 100,000, you cannot get 30 minutes. So another thing I do, I strat, I put stratas in my timing. Oh, you can, oh, I'm sorry, I cannot pay 100,000. It's too expensive. I say, oh, no, it's not too expensive. You just cannot afford it. When you can afford it, you come back and we'll have a conversation. Or would you like to pay for 15 minutes? Perhaps 10 minutes. When the person listens for 10 minutes, the 100,000 will come out because I cannot give you sense in 10 minutes, but I will put out teaser. So it's one shortcut. At least that's what I have used to, trans to move my talent to a product and to monetize it. And then, of course, the other thing is I have moved my talent to the digital form. The same thing I say all the time. I've just moved it to e-books, physical books documentaries, coach, uh, coaching sessions, and I've put it out there. If you want to talk to me, you don't have money, please go and buy a coaching session. That one, it does not require, you won't have question and answer, go and read it. Then when the person goes through, the person will now realize that, ah, no, I need more time with this person. Then you pay and you get more time. So that also works. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, um, you guys uh, were clearly spot on. Um, um, in uh, answering that question. Um, sometime again, um, I always tell people, um, so for instance, after I shared my story, um, Tobore said, I do. I need to um, make this into a book or write a book from it. Why? Because uh, you have seen an opportunity here and you said, hey, we, you can actually make some good money from it. Uh, when you have a good product, all right, people will tell you to your face that you have a beautiful product. A beautiful product doesn't hide itself. Most times when you have it, people will be the ones suggesting to you what to even do with that product. Mm -hmm. If I let me even bust your bubble, a, a beautiful product, when you have it, people will tell you, stop giving this thing out for free. Mm -hmm. People need to start paying for it. That's when you actually know a product that um, it's, um, is viable and that will scale. And most times, again, you have to look at um, market fit for that product also. Sometimes maybe your product or your idea that you have is actually being displayed um, in, the wrong, in the wrong market. Um, sometimes you need to identify your target audience and sell to them. Uh, let me give you a typical scenario. My, I told you my daughter makes beads, all right? And the cost of making one bead is about... Um, um, she spends about um, 900 naira to make a big cost of production. So initially, when she's selling, she'll be selling at 1,002. I told him, I want to change your, your, your target audience. I said, I'm going to introduce you to my friends. And you know how much you're going to be selling this bid? You're going to be selling this bid for 10,000 naira. And when you sell this bid, I'm going to be taking 40%. I said, that if you make it, make it work, I'm game. I said, okay. I started introducing her to my friends. I said, my daughter sells beads, you know, um, hand beads. First and foremost, for those who attend Elevation Church, we went to meet Pastor Debo. I saw that he wear beads. So yeah, go and sell to him. Pastor Debo bought 10 of the beads. You know, he started meeting people, connecting him, connecting her to my friends that were buying. We got a point, they tell my daughter, my daughter, some of them will tell my daughter, I, I, can you give me for 6,000? My daughter said, how many are you buying? Can you buy more so that I can give you a discount? And in the last seven months, the girl, the, the, this young girl has turned over oh, close to 700,000 from selling of beads alone. But what, what am I driving at? Um, product fit for the right market makes a whole, because sometimes I discover people have um, good products, but they are selling to the, um, the, um, the, the wrong um, um, audience. And at the end of the day, it struggles to scale. 
So we must understand where we are selling our products. Even when we have those products, are we in the right market? I'll give you a typical case in point. Nigeria is a very hostile place to do business. I've come to imagine and understand. When you do business here in Nigeria, to scale is a problem. I remember when we were trying to raise money, Nigeria investors would come and meet us and tell us, ah, when are you break even? Have you, uh, where are you making money? I say, are you kidding me? I just started a business. You're already asking me for break even. Meanwhile, a white man wants to invest in me. A white man say, I love the team. I love your energy. That is what I want to invest in. And I also discovered that when we moved our business to, when we launched in Nigeria, for a commissioner to come for your launch is a problem. Wrong market. When we launched in Ghana, the president was there. The minister of transportation was there. When we lost in Uganda, the president couldn't come, but sent a representative and thanked us and said, thank you for bringing this solution to Uganda. Yet I have a president who cannot, I cannot even enter a sort of to go and see my president. Yet after, after raising money, they will come and meet me in the office and tell me, hey, we saw you on TechCrunch. You have raised money. Have you paid your, your tax? So it's a hostile environment to do business. Sometimes you say, this product is actually not right for this market. In other market, people are paying for this product without complaining. In Nigeria, you increase fare. They say it's too expensive. When we started this business, we started with few buses. People were comparing us, their fares to downfall uh, fares. Until we have to cover the niche ourselves. Today, that same um, um, fare that they were paying 300, struggling to pay 300, people pay 1,500. I'm using our vehicles today as we speak. So you need to identify if you have a product. All products can be viable, but not all of them are meant for the audience you are currently dealing with. That is why it will struggle if you don't sell to the right audience. And you need to deliberately identify that by taking your audience, do your um, SWOT analysis on the products, understand where you can sell those products, and take it there. First thing that makes you know that your product is viable, people will tell you this is a beautiful product. Stop selling it for free. Thank you. Wow. Oh, Nigeria. Nigeria will humble you. Oh, Nigeria will humble you. Nigeria will humble you. Nigeria will humble you. Jesus. Nigeria, I should be shaking right now. Uh, oh, my word. I have, I, have to, I, have to, I have to employ the services of a CFO that raised money for Flutter Wave to act because we're about to commence our Series A um, in uh, October to do about um, um, $15 million. I mean, we have to uh, you know, employ the service of a CFO who has done this before to start doing this. And we are going out. We're not depending on Nigerian investors because they will kill you. They will kill oh, you. Oh, God. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. Ubang, is Ubang yeah. still with us? Thank, thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions on the platform? Because I, I might have missed. I can't uh, see anything. Any other questions? Please drop your questions on the platform. I know people are carried away with the, with the lectures and the, set, and the presentation. I have one question. Johnny, please, can I call you after this session? My question is very simple. Okay, man. Uh, uh, there's a commission to that, you know, and um, so we'll talk. <laughs> Don't worry, uh, my sister, now. I, I know, I know. Direct access. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. There's a fine, there's a percentage. I will let you know. I'll send you to form. Um, Are you seeing the Nigeria problem you're talking about? <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Do you think we should monetize our, our passion and monetize our I'm, I'm, what is it? I'm monetizing my access. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> you can call me to, you can call me tomorrow evening. I have another meeting that I'm running. I'm going to be going for attending, um, and it's going to be a very long one at uh, okay. Oriental Hotels. So maybe okay, tomorrow that's fine. we can talk. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. I will. I'll send you a message first. Please, no problem. That's fine. Thank you.
I think it would be, I think it would be fair enough to sort of wrap it here. I am, I was meant to talk on the inevitable change, basically just to remind one the inevitable change and then is entrepreneurship for me. Um, if there's anything any employee should know, anyone in paid employment should know, is that the inevitable change for everybody in paid employment is that someday you are going to leave, whether you like it or not. You don't have a choice. So because if you understand that and you're fully aware of that every time, it begins to bring you to the point of all that Tobore and Johnny have said would begin to make a lot more sense to you. Most people made the mistake of thinking paid employment will just go on forever. It won't. And in fact, in the days that we are, there's a lot more on stability in across industries. Um, COVID also has changed a lot of things. So like never before, employees need to think and act differently. You could leave paid employment anytime. So it only makes sense to begin to prepare early, begin to do that which you need to do. And often 80% or more of people leave paid employment. The only option we have most of the time is entrepreneurship. I don't know if any other option lies. It's largely entrepreneurship. So ultimately, you're going to have to start your own business. And that was the theme of this event, minding your own business. You need to start thinking, giving your mind to the business you're going to be doing outside paid employment. If you can, start while you're still working. Some people have started businesses while they're still in paid employment, testing the waters, learning lessons with a clear direction to go bigger and be able to scale, you know, get into so many things. Like Mr. Johnny said, try your hands on a lot of things. Begin to gather the information, the expertise, the experience you need. But it is very, it's very crucial. It is pertinent that you begin to understand that at some point you would need to start your own business Start giving your mind to that. Do not say, oh, I have 10 years. I have 20 years. The earlier, it is never too early. In a, I wish, I, one of the things I wish to talk to a lot of Gen Z's who are getting employed right now, I was at the training yesterday and I was just saying it to one of them. See, it is never too early. Don't fall into the thought of, ah, there is time. I just started. I have 20 years to go. I have 50 years to go. It's not true. Start minding your own business now. Nobody says you must get a retirement. Nobody says you must spend 20, 30 years before you go into your own business. If you start, start minding your own business now, it will open up opportunities for you. You will find out, you will notice things, opportunities will come to you, you will notice markets, you will be able to catch things. One of the things I picked from what um, Johnny said is the ability to quickly recognize an opportunity and a market. But if you're not paying attention to it, remember I said it was while it was in the co-op, somebody talked about the need for comfortable comfortable buses. Who knows? Who knows that probably if you didn't go into riding that quick way, he never might have thought about um, trips and we never would have trips as it is today. It's possible. So it is very important that while in the process, start something, even while they're paying employment, start getting information, doing research, get mentors, attend this kind of trainings. What it does for you is nature will begin to push your way. You begin to attract the kind of things that can unlock your next level for you in entrepreneurship. So do not sit down and say, you know what, it's not your time. I have nothing to do, just face my nine to five. It is not sustainable. The inevitable change will then meet you suddenly. Suddenly you're out of paid employment and you're wondering what's going on. But if you have it in mind and you're working towards it, planning towards it, it will make a whole lot of difference. And that's what the whole concept of BPH is all about. The BPH platform is actually designed to support people to say, while you are still working, BPED as a mobile app can support you to begin to plan and prepare for the business you will likely go into with services like training, consulting sessions, even an opportunity to save a specific amount towards that business. But you get a support structure that enables you to say, you know what, I can leave paid employment in five years. I can leave paid employment in three years. I can leave paid employment in so and so time and all of that. So it is important that if you're not aware that you're going to move, you likely might not even recognize an opportunity like BPED. You wouldn't understand that you can jump on it. But if you understand that the inevitable change can come anytime, either it's coming by retirement or you're fired or your industry closes up, anything, you begin to pay attention and you will recognize opportunities that are right in front of you. The law of attraction will begin to unfold to you because you are positioned to attract those opportunities. So I just needed to drop that quickly in the absence of any other question or comment before we look at wrapping up.
Mr. Obong, back to you. Thank you.